This question will also walk through the calculation of diluted earnings per share. Standard Corp's net income for 2020 is 150,000. The only potential dilutive security outstanding were 100 were 1,000 call options issued during 2019, with each option being exercisable for one share at $20. None have been exercised, and 30,000 common shares were outstanding during 2020. The average market price of the company's shares during 2020 was $25. Calculate the diluted earnings per share for the year ended December 31st, 2020. Okay, so let's take a look here. So we've got their net income. The only potential dilutive were 1,000 call options ex exercised during 2019, with each option being exercisable for one share at $20. And none have been exercised and 30,000 common shares were outstanding. The market price was $25. So what this means is that someone can, whoever's holding these call options can buy a share at $20 and they can sell it in the market at $25. So the first question we need to answer is, is this option in the money? Because if it wasn't in the money, i.e. it's not profitable for the person to exercise it, then we assume it will not be uh, exercised even in our what if scenario for a diluted earnings per share. However, given that they can buy it at 20 and sell it at 25, we assume it will be exercised for the calculation of diluted earnings per share. What if it said the options could be the option could be exercised at $30 and the market price was 25? Well, that option is not in the money. No one's going to pay $30 for stock that they could go out and buy for $25. So in that case, we wouldn't, cal we wouldn't include that in our calculation of diluted earnings per share because no one would exercise it. It's not a reasonable what if scenario. But in this situation, it is in the money, so we will include it. So the first thing we're gonna do is calculate our basic APS because we always wanna make sure that we have our diluted EPS is truly dilutive, lower than our basic EPS. So we're gonna have Net income, net income minus preferred share dividends divided by the weighted average common shares. So in this case, we're going to have 150,000. There's no preferred share dividends. And it says that 30,000 shares are outstanding. Again, keeping it easy on us. The shares haven't changed during the year. So it means that the share numbers is going to be consistent. So we're going to have 150,000 divided by 30,000 is going to give us $5 per share. Okay, so now let's look at our diluted earnings per share. So remember for diluted earnings per share, we need to change both the net income number and the share number. So let's start with our change to net income. So it's going to say a thousand call options with each option being exercisable for one share at $20. One share at $20, none have been exercised. So the proceeds on the exercise of the option is going to be a thousand shares times $20, which is the exercise price, which is going to give us 20,000. And the that's going to give us $20,000. And then how many shares are, can we buy with $20,000? So we're looking at the treasury method here. So what can we buy with treasury shares? So how many shares can we buy um, with shares at market? So we can buy, so if we have $20,000, we can buy, the shares are at 25, we can buy 25 shares. gives us $20,000 divided by 25 shares gives us 800. We can buy 800 shares, which means we need to issue, incremental issue, 
our shortage is 200 shares. So let's take a look at what we did here. So we're figuring out the change to net income. This is actually the change to the number of shares. Change to the number of shares because there is no change to net income. Let's talk about that in a minute. So how many shares do we need to issue for this option? Well, we know we're gonna get the $20 when the options are exercised. So the company is going to receive $20,000. However, they can't buy a thousand shares with $20,000. So we're assuming that they're going into the market, the company is, and trying to buy shares from other investors. So, but the problem is no investor is going to sell them their stock at $20. They need to pay $25, which is the market value. So if they take their $20,000 and they go to the market and try to round up shares, they'll only be able to round up 800 shares. So they're going to be short 200 shares, which means they're going to actually need to issue an additional 200 shares to make sure they have the thousand shares to, to issue the option holders when they exercise. So that's gonna be the increase in the shares. Now let's take a look at this. It says the only potential securities outstanding were a thousand dollar share call options with each option being exercisable. So this is not a debenture or a bond, meaning that there's actually no interest on this. This is simply an option to this is simply an option to buy shares at a certain price. So therefore there's no change to net income. So change to net income equals zero. So let's calculate our diluted earnings per share, which is gonna always equal adjusted net income minus preferred share dividends divided by adjusted we did average common shares. So in this case, there's no adjustment to net income. So we're still going to have our 150,000 that we had in our basic. There were no preferred share dividends, but now what we're going to have, so we had 30,000 shares outstanding in our basic calculation. Now we're going to add 200, which is the amount that we're actually going to increase in share capital. And this also has to be weighted by the period of time. So when, uh, when could these options be issued with each option exercisable? The, okay, so calculate the diluted earnings per share. So actually, this is assuming that they're exercised at the beginning of the year. So we are going to have the earnings per share is gonna be 497. Now, are our diluted earnings per share lower than our basic earnings per share? Yes, so it's okay, it is anti-dilutive. So we're gonna show both of those earnings per share. We're gonna have our diluted earnings per share at 497 and our basic earnings per share at $5. Okay, so we did A. Now it says, assume that the $1,000 call options were instead issued on November 1st, 2020. Calculate diluted earnings per share for the year ended. The average market price during the last two months was $25. So we're still using the $25. So the only thing that's going to change in our calculation is that we remember when we calculate the weighted average number of shares. So looking up here, so you know how we said that we were going to issue these incremental shares of 200. Now, this was assuming that they were outstanding for the whole year. Now think back to when we were calculating the weighted average number of shares. Remember how we had to multiply it by the fraction of the year that they were outstanding so that we could take into account the fact that our net income is earned continuously throughout the year and that therefore we need to take into account how long the capital has been outstanding. Part B is saying that rather than this 200 shares being outstanding for the whole year, like we were assuming in part A, part B is assuming that this these shares were only issued on November 1st. So we know that the incremental shares we need to issue are 200. And we need to multiply it now by the fraction of the year that are outstanding. We've been told that they're going to be issued now in November. So we're just going to have November and December. So we're going to have 2 over 12. That's going to change this 200 shares outstanding on a weighted average basis to 33 on a weighted average. So now, when we calculate our diluted earnings per share, we're still going to have the 150,000 of net income, no change. 
there's still no preferred share dividends, but now we have our 30,000 that we were shares outstanding that we were told in the question. Those shares were outstanding for the whole year. So there's no change to that. That's a weighted average already because they're at the whole year, no change. But now rather than adding the 200 as we did before, we're only adding 33 because here we were assuming that the shares were outstanding for the whole year. So 12 months, meaning that the 200 was for the whole year, there's no weighted average. But here, if the shares were only issued, the additional 200 shares were only issued in November, then once we multiply the 200 by two months out of 12 months, it changes it to say, well, on a weighted average basis, we really only had 33 shares outstanding. So therefore our diluted earnings per share is going to become 4.99. Now is our earnings per share, our diluted earnings per share, higher than our basic. Well, let's take a look. Let's just double check. No, our basic earnings per share was $5 and our diluted earnings per share, assuming that the options are exercised or the call options are exercised in November, it's going to be $4.99. So we're still okay. We're getting close, but we're still fine. So that's B. And C said, how would your answers for part A and B change? If in addition to the information for parts A and B, the company issued or wrote a thousand dollar put options with an exercise price of $15. So $15 means that we, the company would sell the stock in the market for $15. So these options are not in the money. The exercise price is lower than the market price meaning that if the company has a, uh, an exercise price of $15, so who is going to, so who is going to sell being exercisable? So who is going to agree to buy stock at $15 when they could buy it in the market at $25? Therefore, these options would be excluded from the calculation of diluted earnings per share because it's not reasonable to assume that anybody would be interested in uh, in accepting those op or exercising those options. <laughs>